Hi, this is Tim Hamilton, the co-host of the Maryland Crabs, and I'm here with a crab cake for your listening pleasure. What's a crab cake? Well, it's not quite a full episode. It's just a little snippet. Stay tuned and check it out. Make sure you check us out on themarylandcrabs.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MD Crabs Podcast or find us on Facebook at the Maryland Crabs Podcast. Don't forget, subscribe, rate us, iTunes. Go there now. And another neighborly visit from my friend David Lasher, who is a candidate for the 3rd Congressional District in Maryland. That's correct. And a libertarian candidate, I might add. I guess that's a pretty important differentiation there. That is also correct. We were actually having a great discussion before this about uh, national politics and Trump and the media. And I think we're, we're both fairly close on it, I think. You know? The Venn diagram, we have a fair amount of overlap, yes. The cultural divide right now is, such, is, is worse than I've ever seen in my life. You know, and I'm not that old. I'm 48, and I didn't really start paying attention to this till I was in my late 20s. But I've never seen us more divided as a country. And I think everyone has responsibility for that, not the least of which is Trump himself. But like I said before, you know, he and everyone else has said this, he's the symptom, not the cause. But, um, you know, the media, the, the Republicans, the Democrats, the mainstream Republicans, the far right, the far left, and I'm not doing a false equivalency, but I'm exhausted. I think everybody is. Mm -hmm. I think it's worse than uh, not only than I have ever experienced, but ever could have imagined, uh, even six months ago. I, I think it's gotten worse. I think that um, a glimmer of hope, if you want one, a light at the end of the tunnel, perhaps, is that as I, as a candidate, go around and I talk to people, regular people, everybody, regular people are fed up too. And what we're seeing in Washington, I don't think it's representative of who we are as a people. Or even on social media. I, I agree on the social media as well. I don't have a good theory as to why on social media... The voices that stand out and get all the attention are so up unrepresentative. In politics, there are some established theories that I, I agree with, some explanations that I agree with. Uh, but we're just so polarized now. And um, it, at least in what we get through the media, right? Uh, what comes across our TVs, what comes across the radio waves, what comes across our computers. And I don't think it is actually representative of who regular people in America are. And I'm going to say that that's a good 60, 70 percent of Americans. Uh, we're not part of what we're seeing and being subjected to, I believe. So, I mean, if we look at this, what's happening on social media and what's happening on the talking heads on cable news and you would think that we are ripe for at least a third party, because if you look at it right now and you divvied everybody up, you'd look at the Republican Party, of which you used to be a member. Yes, sir. Right? So right now you have what I would call your traditional Reagan Republicans, which at the time seemed radical, but now seem damn well center. I will confess that I, <laughs> I was a Reagan Republican. Right. And so yeah. that's what I yearn for. That's what I wish we had back. You have your the remnants of the Tea Party. You know, they're still there. I don't think the Trumpism sprang from that. I think that was kind of separate. I do too. You have the Trumpists, then you have the far right, and then you have the center, slight right. And then when you get to the left, you, I mean, the Bernie has kind of faded. Or he's been augmented. Yeah, or Elizabeth Warren, you know, that segment's out there. And people say that the-, the Kamala the, Harris. Right, that the Democrats have gone far, far left. I don't- Ben know. Jealous here in, yeah. here in Maryland. So don't you think that we have all those different factions that we're sort of grouping two groups of people into, or all these groups of people into two different categories- don't you think the time would be ripe now for a third party where people are like, I am done. I, I, I need something else that have the remnants of what I believe in that's not caught up in this hyper-partisanship, which just where a victory in the Republican eyes means owning the libs. You know? I, I'll go further. Not just a third party, but maybe a fourth. And exactly. Fifth. I would uh, like to see like a parliamentary. Not 20, right? No. Not 20 um, uh, to, to, to exaggerate and be dramatic. But I came to my own conviction almost a year, exactly a year ago. It was last holiday season, so 11 months or so ago. I came to my conviction that the reason that we're getting so much polarization and dysfunction coming out of Washington especially is that we've just got – we're limited to these two parties, the so-called duopoly as some, right. some people call it. And – the two parties, for whatever reasons, uh, for, in the last 20 years, have become captive of their extremists. Mm -hmm. And I think that— Exactly. Yeah, you know what? Exactly. That, that sums it up beautifully. I, I think the, what I call the broad middle of stretching from—we mentioned uh, on, on the right-hand side the, the Reagan Republicans. I'm going to go on the left-hand side. JFK liberals— 
Okay. Okay. Now, let me tell you what I mean. Um, let it sink in. But what I mean, what do I mean by a JFK liberal? I do mean somebody who has more faith in government solutions to social pro- problems than I personally have. Right. Right. So I'm not a. I'm not a JFK liberal. But with a JFK liberal, I have uh, good. De- it, it's good back and forth debates. With a JFK liberal, there are recognition of constraints, like budget constraints, especially. JFK liberals typically embrace a role for private em- enterprise in competitive markets. Right, JFK. Like public private partnerships and those sort of things. Right. Well, even corporations. I mean, JFK himself, right? Is, is certainly. Right? Um, uh, yeah, he wasn't far off for Trump. He but, was a, a rich kid womanizer. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean. But, but, but private enterprise, there was no contempt for it. There was no demonization of, of corporations uh, uh, from, from JFK, certainly. Right. Uh, and there was a respect for and, and, a, and a sense of blessing for having the Constitution and, and its institutions and the values and traditions behind it. That's, a, to me, a, a, a JFK liberal. That's folks who have been, a lot of folks who have been in the Democratic Party, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Reagan Republicans. I, I think if you take that spectrum of, of politics in America, I think that that's 55, 60% of America. Right. I think that that whole spectrum is unrepresented today in our national politics. So who changed? I think the Republican Party, I can tell you, was changed by Reagan by letting the religious right creep into the tent. And I will go far and say that most of the problems that we're having right now and the division that we have and the person who changed the Republican Party the most was Newt Gingrich. Of course, there's other factors that are involved. Who do you think did that to the Democratic Party? I think that with the Democratic Party, it was post Bill Clinton. I think that it was Barack Obama in his second term, not, not his first. I think that in those years, he began to give the stamp of moral authority to identity politics. How so? Uh, the memos that went out to the universities uh, say, saying, yes, let's, let's strengthen race and, and gender and sexuality uh, as, as criteria uh, on campuses. Um, so you're saying that it was his efforts to kind of modify the cultural identity or at least the, the cultural influences in the country, directly as president. Here's my disappointment in, in President Obama. You go back to his 2008 speech, early 2008, March, a more perfect union. Mm-hmm. Very nuanced on questions of race and sources of social problems and disparities in America. So he, he, he proposed solutions that were more government-oriented than, than I endorse, but it was, it was a good speech. It was... Uh, um, good vision. He he stood, he, he stood a chance. He had the opportunity to be uh, a healer, uh, but I don't know why or how. By the time we get to his second term, we've lost from him from the White House courage on questions of race, right? uh, nuance. Um, we've, we've lost the theme that, that Barack Obama had in 2008 of uh, responsibility for oneself, responsibility for one's own community in, in respect to any kind of problem. The, the problem that Barack Obama used to talk about uh, was the breakdown of families in, in, in the black community. Right. And the impact that that had on him personally and, 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 uh, and, and on that community. Well, by the time we get to the, the second term, we're not hearing about that anymore. Right. We get let's talk talk um, here at home, Baltimore. Right. Uh-huh. We, we get the um, Freddie Gray incident and and riots. And uh, besides our own state's so attorney prematurely. Um, uh, going after the the, the police, or uh, the, b- besides that, we had Barack Obama's Department of Justice issuing a report that had the opportunity to dive down into the issues and 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 speak to the problem of intergenerational poverty that's at the root cause of what we see. Sure, right, right, but but instead, it just blamed the police, right, and so. Quite predictably, since then, right, the police have backed off of community-based policing. 
the crime rates have gone up, the homicide rates have gone up, and we've got a terrible breach of trust in the community between the police and and, and the people, and we've got to bring them back together. My disappointment with Barack Obama is I thought he was almost perfectly positioned, and from the language he used, the thoughts he expressed back in 2008, I think he had it in him to bring us together, um, but he didn't do so, and that's a disappointment to me. It's interesting for me because I think about uh, when race relations were were its worst, and people said race relations have never been worse than now, and I think about 1989 when Bonfire of the Vanities came out, 1990, the Tom Wolfe novel, and that's when you had uh, Tawana Raleigh and Al Sharpton and, you know, and The Wilding and the, the, the Central Park 7, and you know, th- it was for race relations in this country, maybe it was that, that breakthrough that we needed that people were finally talking about it. Then we move forward and you start to have social scientists look at, you know, what are some of the causes of the breakdown in black families? And some were saying, well, a lot of it is the war on drugs because it puts black men away disproportionately when it comes to crack versus The war cocaine. on drugs needs to be overhauled, yes. Right, and it's split up black no families. Question. So I think then you get to a tricky part where you have the president saying it's the problem with the government and people on the right saying, no, it's all about personal responsibility. Personal res- yep. But then you do have an issue with the police. I mean, you can't ignore that, but... Uh, but uh, but uh, We need more transparency and accountability, right? right? And But everyone goes to their corners when someone comes out because he's, he's looking at two or three different groups and saying, hey, you all have to be responsible for your various areas in this problem. And all three of them have their fists up. So maybe at that time, he just, he looked at the police, like you said, and all of a sudden they move right. And the Republicans, they kind of co-opt that anger and saying, you know, they, they're anti, the Democrats are anti-law and order, you know, that they want the criminals to roam free. And no one has addressed the core problem that you talked about. It, it, it's, we're lacking the nuanced conversations, mm-hmm. right? There's, there's no there's, such there's... thing as nuance anymore. I'm not saying that to be facetious. I am, I am bitterly disappointed to see the death of nuance in this country, that you cannot have these nuanced dis- discussions. I call it angels and demons politics, Mm -hmm. right? If you differ from me, maybe in your background, maybe in your politics, either one, if you differ from me, it's not that you share an objective and just a different way of getting there. It's that you lack moral standing. You're a demon. Therefore, I'm not only going to not talk with you, I'm going to shout you down, right? I'm going to keep you from speaking. We have to escape that part of where we are. And the Kavanaugh nomination, the Kavanaugh hearing is a perfect example of that because that exhausted all of us, I think. That was, it's a difficult situation because I grew, I grew up in that culture that, that Montgomery County, I didn't go to Georgetown Prep, but um, you know, I knew several of the people who signed the letter in support of Kavanaugh. You know, the Holy Girls went to Holy Cross and Holton Arms and and Stone Ridge and all the Maculata and all those places. But it, that was, I don't want to say it was nuanced, except it was layered, that one of them was not telling the truth. And it came down to who you believed and and should he have due process? And should she believe, be believed automatically? And it, it got to that point where you say the angels and demons. And I saw people lining up against each other and on, online especially, and they were just shooting at each other because you were either on her side or his side. And it, it, it was very difficult to navigate that. It should have never gotten to where it got in September. Um, I, I think that partly the R's, but, but mostly the D's by the time you get to, to September – uh, turned it into um, something it should have never become they so did. vicious. So vicious, and and I do look. None of us has all the all the information, right? But it it, it sure does look like uh, Senator Feinstein's staff had information about the allegations. It's, Mid late summer, sure, and this, right? it was politicized. And and anyone who says it's not, I don't. You you can be a Democrat and be outraged and what have you, but of course, like we said before the the podcast, never let a good crisis go to waste. And that is both sides. And the, and it went way too far. I, I feel like both Doctor Ford and and Brett Kavanaugh were victims in different ways in, in their treatment in September. Uh, I, neither of them should have been um, had to go through what they did go through themselves and their families. But if we put that aside for a second, yep. what happened? The process, and this is where I do blame the Republicans. When I look at the Merrick Garland, they they started that. And I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying that 
it, it ultimately doesn't matter who started it. It just matters where you are. But I will say for the, the pearl clutchers on, on the red side who says, well, this is their obstructionist. They won't, well, hold on. You corrupted the system in the beginning. The, 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 the Democrats were bitter at what they saw as a stolen Supreme Court, you know, whether it was or wasn't. But you can't be shocked that there was ramifications for that. And furthermore, I mean, we're looking at the escalation. What happens, you know, that if the, if the Democrats take the election in 2020, they can just stack that court if they want to. And then the Republicans come in and they can stack it. And all of a sudden we have 50 Supreme Court justices, which might not be a bad idea, by the way. Well, I don't know about that. But um, uh, somewhere we went beyond normal political shenanigans and the majority, whomever the majority is, and it's always changing, right? Mm-hmm using their, uh, exploiting their prerogatives. It went beyond that to something very ugly um, in, in September, by the time we get to mid and late September. Uh, look, I was on Capitol Hill in the late, as a staffer in the late 80s and the early 90s, and I'm here to tell you that R's and D's engaged in their shenanigans, but they did work together to get things yeah. done, too. I feel the, like it's all an act to a big extent. Like that, that they, there's some kabuki that they're all playing roles, but they know what their roles are. You know, I. But it, but but something has become different in that there is genuine antipathy now. Yeah. There's a genuine lack of restraint on both sides. Remember, I I left the R's, right? I'm not. Um, but you're still like center right. Um. I, I, I don't I, mean to box you, but I'm a libertarian, which if you want to call that center right, sure. Um, uh, you know, my heritage is Reagan Republican, but on the on the other hand, on social social questions of personal lifestyle and 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 personal choice, because your your motto uh, is uh, it, it's the it's personal choice. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's uh, I don't line up with uh, traditional Republicans in any way, shape, or form on 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 those kinds of issues, right? Whether it's cannabis and opioids now, or mm-hmm. whether it's the abortion question, I, I, that question has to be left to the women who are facing it, right? Mm-hmm. The, the, I, that's always been a point of disconnect for me with the Republicans. Where are you on regulation? Regulation, I'm generally uh, uh, of the opinion that less is more. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, I almost always am. The Here's the thing. Sometimes businesses themselves to have a proper market, right? That's not just Hobbesian uh, yeah. co- competition, right? And I come from the business world, right? Businesses themselves often uh, want some level of regulation, right? To to for for fair competition, right? I have an example. Sure. Uh, uh, a small example. Uh, I was at the Department of Health uh, for in 16, 17, 18, and 17 especially. I was uh, handling uh, – I, I got some visibility to issues in Ocean City, pools, right? right? Hotels and pools. Pools are regulated for reasons of safety, right? right? Public safety M- makes Staff, sense, and, yeah. right? And the state programs for overseeing the, um, the licensing – we're not going well. Let me just say it that way. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I got involved to help resolve it. And, and what I will say about, here, here's the trade-off. The pool operators themselves, the hotel owners, they want safe pools. Right. They know that the tourism industry is ill-served in Ocean City if but one hotel has a pool that has a brain-eating amoeba. Did you read that about yeah, that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right? That's not good for anybody. So a level of safety is generally um, accepted by, by most business operators. So you would say regulation in the name of safety. You know, that's why you but want the got, FAA. That's why you want the health department, which it, is it, state and county. And efficiently and, affi- and fairly administered without undue cost. The, a large part of the problem that we fixed right. uh, uh, with the pool regulations was that we didn't ha- even we didn't even have an inbox for um, sending a question or, or requesting a permit if if David was 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 on vacation, right. right? And we didn't have consistent regulations from one county line to another. We do now, right? right? So so I'm not just going to say all regulation is bad, right? Mm-hmm. But I but I uh, m- my instinct is always less regulation rather than more. So looking at the state. Maryland is one of the wealthiest states per capita in the country. Maybe maybe the most, the wealthiest per capita, I believe, around there. Might be. I never thought of it. Yeah. Thought and, about it. Yeah. And we have a governor who, by all accounts, is wildly popular. So he's a, a center Republican in a Democratic state that's, I think, the second or third most Democratic in, in the country. Mm-hmm. So people think we're going in the right direction. That said, the third congressional district is 
used as the poster child for gerrymandering. Um, I have my issues with it. Um, I feel it doesn't represent me as a citizen of the third district that because I have a representative who is covering where I am here, parts of the Eastern shore over into what Washington County, or just, it just stretches out. There's not a lot we can do about that. Well, I mean, we eventually well, we, can. we must, yeah. <laughs> but when you look at uh, John Sarbanes and, and I think your frustration that I hear from other candidates, which is getting coverage in an entrenched legislature, whether it be on a national level, federal level, or local level, is what do you bring to the table that would improve on what John Sarbanes is doing? Well, let's talk gerrymandering for a second. So whatever it is that I bring to the table that's different and, and in my estimation better, here, here, here's the challenge. Let's, we just spent a, a, a good deal of time talking about how frustrated both, both of us are. Um, with politics in America today. But everyone hates Congress, but they love their congressmen. Uh, which is um, interesting, yeah. yes. Uh, I, had, I had a neighbor, they were railing about the Senate a few years ago, and they said they said they should all be ousted, every one of them, well, except for Barbara Mikulski. She's, she's one of the good ones. And I'm like, yeah, of course. I was re-listening to um, Barack Obama's early September speech mm -hmm. he, he, that he gave at the University of Illinois about democracy in America. And um, nobody is satisfied with where we are. And everybody recognizes that this midterm election is one of the most important midterm elections. I've never seen a more, one, more important one in my lifetime. Right. And yet, so, so here I am as a third party candidate. Uh, I am one of three choices on the ballot for the Maryland third on November 6th. And... I am not receiving coverage by or access to the mainstream media. I am not even receiving the opportunity from civic organizations like the League of Women Voters, who I will chide and am chiding, for And for a people debate. who don't know, for, they are the ones who traditionally run the most important debates in the country. Yes, they, they have, for many reasons, the the standing and the role of organizing non debates because they're nonpartisan historically. Right. Right? Well, there is not a debate in the Maryland 3rd Congressional District uh, for the given reason that gerrymandering makes it too difficult, according to League of Women Voters. And for people who don't know, the 3rd District, which they call the Pterodactyl District, yes. when you look at it, stretches down, and you can correct me because you probably know every inch of it by this point. Not every inch. So it's Annapolis, think downtown Annapolis, and, and uh, uh, to where we're sitting, Thomas Point. Right. Uh, it goes along the Chesapeake and jumps up to Gibson Island and to Pasadena, but does not include Severna Park. <laughs> right. It stripes over to the airport. Uh, down across Howard uh, County, where um, 175 and 95 meet, and goes out to um, Odenton and almost all the way out to Mount Airy. That's crazy. It stripes up 95, like, like 100 yards either side of 95, up into the city. It includes um, uh, the stadiums and, and the Inner Harbor, uh, goes out to where the tunnels come up, 895 and 95. Right. Um, and then it goes all the way up to Parkville. At one point, it's only one road wide. Uh, over to um, uh, Towson and Ruxton and and all the way out to um, Reisterstown. It's crazy. That's, and for those people who haven't thought about this that much, that you have a U.S. representative who is – looking out for the interest of everyone who lives in that district. And the point of having a district is that you have people who are like-minded or they have a, a culture or a uh, they live similar lifestyles that, that and have similar concerns so that the representative can address that in Congress. It, the, the, our district, the Maryland 3rd, and any gerrymandered district like it, and there are far They're, too many of them, they do not represent a natural community. Right? It, that's the word I'm looking for, the natural community, it, and it's it, not. I, I call it modern-day Jim Crow. It is it is maps drawn by an established uh, elite, and and R's and D's both do it. Right. And pox on both of them. Shame yeah. on both of Texas. them. Texas, uh, North Car Pennsylvania, North Carolina. Oh, uh, Pennsylvania got smacked down. Yeah, the, they did. Uh, both parties do Court. it. It is a practice by which the established politicians uh, and, and parties disenfranchise intentionally one third to you know one half. 
of their constituents. Mm-hmm. They, 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 they render the votes of their own constituents futile and meaningless. And then we wonder why we've got what we've got, the extremism, the cynicism, the feeling of people that they're, if they get involved, it's not going to matter. So my own disappointment from, from this cycle has been that uh, not that I didn't raise but a 60th of the money of, of John Sarbanes and did turn out to be about a 60th. Right. right. Well, I mean, but in all fairness, a phone call is made from the campaign manager and there's people who just regularly write checks. I'm not, I'm not picking on I, I, representative I'm, Sarbanes. I'm just saying this is the reality of it. That is a reality of it's it. It's a disappointing and reality. And that hasn't even been um, disappointing to me. I, I, going into it, I knew that that was going to be a challenge. And how much of that money does he really have to spend and how much goes to the national committee? I, I, I don't know. Right? Um, I did expect that the Baltimore Sun, right? the, the mainstream media, I did the, the editors there, the, the producers at WBAL and, and um, you know, the, our, our local radio and, and, um, and TV, I did think that with where we are with our politics today and the disappointment with it, the importance of this midterm election, I did think that there would be more interest in bringing in different voices and points of view just to hear from them, uh, to make it more of a, a stew instead of just two elements plopped on the plate, take one or take the other, no other choices. I'm generally a defender of the media for the most part. But this is one case where I would say a third party is probably without the flash of, say, a Bernie Sanders is not in the interest of the media because they like the, the juggernaut. They like the show. You know, the David. For, I That's don't think, their, it's their business model. Right. And I worked. In That's the media, how they get audiences. I worked in the media for, you know, I worked in TV news for like seven years, something like that. And for people who say they protect the, the left, I'm telling you, the TV, they want to screw anybody they can. I, I don't think that it's it's preserving a, a kind of culture or or an ideology, but I do think that this is bread and circuses. And when you look at CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, and look what passes for news on a lot of that, and there's some great reporters who who, who do great news on that, and there, there's some who don't. Uh, you know, uh, Chris Wallace, who's with Fox News, and I'm sorry he is. He's a great journalist. I'm impressed by Chris Wallace. He's yes. very good. You know, and. Um, Maggie Haberman for the New York Times. Um, I like, uh, and f- for my money, the Matt Taibbi is the best reporter out there, period, for the Rolling Stone. He's just amazing. I don't know, Matt. He's amazing. But um, here's a difference. You just triggered this memory of mine. No, so yeah. I, I, I said I was a, a staffer on Capitol Hill back in the late 80s and early 90s, and, and it was different in the way the D's and the R's um, interacted. It, was tr- it truly was different. Another thing that was different, firsthand experience, Washington Post. Mm-hmm. Were they biased? Did they have their uh, liberal politics bias? No. Yeah, they did. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't like it is today. It, 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 they were genuinely interested in bringing in other voices and other points of view and maintaining their role of, of critiquing the, what Bill Clinton was saying, right? Or proposing right. when he was president, right? I do think that we've lost that. I don't know why. I think it's part of the problem. I do want to suggest a solution. We must be coming up on our time here. I left the Republican Party, joined the Libertarian Party was my choice. But I, I, I got dissatisfied with politics, the polarization, the dysfunction in 16 and 17 went through my own pers- personal journey of asking how did we wh- how did we get here and what can I do about it and I came to the conclusion that the problem with the two party system I agree we could have a conversation about healthcare policy and you and I have right, right? and we'd agree so- in some places and disagree that's not the fundamental problem the fundamental problem is the two party system the angels and the devils uh, politics the my win is your your win is my loss right we have to get zero away from that. Game. The zero-sum game. We have to escape that. Until we escape that, we're going to continue along this way. Do you think we can? I mean, I, I, honestly, I do. I, 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 you're a lot I, more you know, optimistic than I am. Here, here, here I stand. I just and, don't and, like people. If I were going around and not finding a good reception for the people that I actually that I engage with, if I were finding that everybody was as fed up and polarized as as, as what we see on TV and through our computers, 
then I would lose hope. But I'm not finding that. I, I, I'm finding that the, the activists and the media and the politicians are not representative of most of us. And so here's, here's what I would encourage. I would ask anybody who is fed up with what we've got and who isn't fed up with what we've got to start thinking about other parties to vote for, whether R, D, L, Libertarian, Green Party, mm -hmm. consider them, right? I, I believe in the marrow of my bones that where we need to get is to four or five parties. It'll change the whole dynamic of politics in terms of what politicians can get away with in terms of what they claim or how they treat others, because there'll be other parties for people to gravitate towards, for voters to gravitate towards. Uh, I'm one of them. I'm lost. I don't have a party. Uh, no one. I, I lean Democrat, but I, I'm not a Democrat. And if there was another option there, I would join it. Uh, and, and I agree with the Republicans sometimes on some things. Or I did. I, I think that the Republican Party needs to break into at least two parties. I think the Democratic Party needs to break into at least two parties because they are both now, in 2018, artificial constructs trying to hold together uh, uh, groups, blocks that, that believe different things, have different politics. So, so what's wrong with disaggregating? What's wrong— What's wrong with having four or five parties? It works parties, in Europe. The two parties don't want it, and they make it hard as hell for third parties to compete. That is a very, very large part of the problem. That's the one thing they do agree upon. And here's what I am what I didn't expect, and I'm going to say it again. What I didn't expect, and I'm most disappointed uh, with through my uh, through my run so far through here, you know, mid late Octo October. I I'm also finding that the civic organizations and the mainstream media are also bought into the two-party system. It's conditioned. I, they say, you're not going to win. You're only going to get 8% of the vote if you double what's ever been done as a libertarian. But so I, we can't talk to you. I, You've only raised 1 60th of, of what the incumbent, Mr. Sarbanes, has raised. You're never going to win. We're not going to talk to you. That's not right. That's not, that's, that's, um, that's not democracy. That's not healthy for us. What I like is that uh, you have very clear thinking on a lot of these issues. That you, Some of you, them, maybe. Well, you do, and you have some great videos on your website. And for anyone who wants more information, you go to Lasher, L-A-S-H-A-R, 2018.us. Yeah, That's you your can. website. And there's, you have lots of videos, and you have blogs that are very clear as to where you land on the issues. And, and I, I found them very easy to follow. You actually changed my mind on a couple of things. You had me thinking on another one. I disagreed with you on another one. But it, it's a great website. And... I think what a point is just explore what options you have out there. That is the message. If you're not satisfied with what we're getting, explore opportunities and whether you act on whether you decide to vote a different way this year, 2018 or not, you need to we all need to keep thinking about what kind of choices we want to have available to us and what we want to do with our votes in 2020 and beyond. Dave Thanks for bringing the beer, and thanks for sitting down again. We got to do this more without a podcast. Uh, this was fun. Remember, you got to run for more stuff just so we can have an excuse to drink in the middle of the day. Oh, maybe uh, we can do that. All right, Dave. Good luck. Thank you. This has been the Maryland Crabs Podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously. Go! You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.